Mute the mic, there we go. <laughs> well, good evening, everybody. Um, let's start with a word of prayer uh, because we're not going to actually uh, look at any verses. Now, I know that means some of y'all are going to think that you should turn off. Leave it on. And the reason is, is this book has so much to do with what's going on in this country right now. So just hang on, okay? Let's pray. Father, as we come this evening, we thank you once again for your wonderful love, for your care, for your mercy that is new every morning, and your loving kindness that endures forever. And we're so thankful because we recognize we need that mercy every day. And that loving kindness, the idea that it endures forever is because, wow, if, it, if we could mess this up, <laughs> we would. So we thank you for all of that. Thank you for the forgiveness that we have in Christ Jesus. As we look at what's going on in the world around us today, we see, as the Bible teaches, there's nothing new under the sun. And with that in mind, there are things here for us to learn from a book that was written 2,000 years ago. And so we would ask, Lord, that you would enlighten our eyes and our minds and give us grace to understand and see how these things apply so that we might live in a way that's honoring and glorifying to you. We do think of Carolyn McIntosh as she goes in for a procedure on Tuesday. Pray, Lord, that that procedure would be complete and successful and that she would recover without any uh, difficulties. I know she's probably going to have to go through some kind of uh, treatment and all that. And I just pray, Father, that you give her grace through that whole situation. For uh, Jean Vandermeer, I pray, Father, that you might raise her up to good health again and that you would continue to use her and her husband, Paul, as they try and reach people in Mexico uh, with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Again, we think of uh, Grandma Ruby. Pray, Father, that you would comfort her and continue to give her grace. And Leon also, as uh, he has to deal with uh, missing his wife in uh, more than one way. Thank you for this time together in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Okay. Uh, yeah, uh, pray for Carolyn McIntosh. She goes in Tuesday for a, a procedure, and uh, I'm sure she would appreciate that. Now, Second Peter, if you look at your notes, you'll see that... Uh, this is the introduction. Now, some people think that this kind of material is the boring kind of stuff, but it helps you understand the context from which the author is writing the things that he writes. Uh, so it is kind of important. What I've been seeing is, as I said in my prayer, there's nothing new under the sun. Now, in uh, 1 Peter, we saw that people were under persecution and Peter was encouraging them as well as the people that were over them to uh, be about the business of encouraging them so that they might be able to live under that persecution in a way that is honoring and glorifying to Jesus. Now, in today's day and age, are we under persecution? Not the way we define persecution, but if you think about the agreement that we have with our government called the Constitution of the United States with the Bill of Rights, yes, the church has been under a direct attack from some politicians. When the First Amendment, which says that we have the Congress shall make no law, okay, now someone actually excused the governors because Congress didn't make a law. If Congress can't make a law, a governor can't make a law. By the way, governors can't make laws anyway, <laughs> okay? But concerning the freedom of religion and the practice thereof. Now, why is that important? What's one of the things that we do as a practice when it comes to our uh, faith? We meet together. Now, back in March, we can all go back there and understand we didn't know a lot. We just knew it was bad. And between ignorance, a lack of understanding, and Trying to be careful here. Well, we'll get to the propaganda. And stupidity, okay? I'm sorry, putting sick people in a convalescent center is not the way to keep older people alive. It's a good way to kill them. Now, intentional, we'll let God worry about that one. But we do know that five states did that, and 40% of the death rates in those states were old people in convalescent centers that COVID was invited into, okay? Ignorance and stupidity. That was the stupidity part. Ignorance, we didn't know much. 
Uh, the things that we've learned over the last nine months and how to deal with COVID uh, probably has saved a lot of lives. If, if you've noticed, the death rate has dropped a lot. In fact, back in August, they were saying the death rate had dropped so much that they couldn't even call it an epidemic, never mind a pandemic. Now, they're still calling it a pandemic, but those labels are given according to how many people get it, how many people die, things like that. Now, throw in your propaganda, your purposeful misinformation. For what purpose? Well, we can list probably a bunch of things, but one of the ways that it's been used against the church is the church meeting is considered a super spreader. It doesn't matter according to the Constitution. You cannot stop the practice of the church according to the Constitution. Now, again, back in March when we didn't know anything, to willingly agree to not meet, totally understand. And I'm not blaming anybody in this church. I, I think the reopening crew has done a, a great job. There are a few things that still need to be worked out, I understand, uh, but when some of your people still aren't back yet, it's hard to start up some ministries because there's some of your teachers, that kind of thing. So uh, I'm, I'm not saying anything negative about what we've done. I think we've done a good job. Now, for some of our people, whew, man, the mask was an issue. For some, it was you're not wearing the mask all the time. That's an issue. For some, it's you're wearing the mask anytime. That was an issue. Oy vey. Why did we wear the mask? Out of concern for others. Not because we believe the mask really does much or because the governor said it. It was out of concern for others. And so with that in mind, when we come to what some of COVID has brought about, we see within the hearts of some, the church is non-essential as far as they, they labeled it, not me, okay? It's non-essential and therefore it can be shut down for non-scientific reasons. <laughs> okay, now it's not persecution in the sense of someone's been arrested, they've been brought to jail, they've been beaten on the bottom of their foot with a billy club or anything like that. No, I understand. But it is the beginnings. You can see the seeds have been sown. It's the beginnings. Now, why is that important? Because when we come to 2 Peter, here these people have been under persecution and something that happens when people are under stress, well, sometimes they give into that stress and they fall into sin and things like that. Sometimes they give into that stress and they renounce. And within all of that, there arises false teachers. Hmm. We don't have any false teachers in our secular field uh, dealing with politics. None at all. Actually, what we have found is that which we thought was semi-safe all of a sudden turned coat and became part one of the rest of them. Now, it doesn't mean everybody in that group uh, falls into that category, but we have seen where, wow, the idea of fake news, boy, is it real. Not only that, but fake representatives of the people that has also come to the forefront. Why is that important? Because Peter is going to be dealing with, under that stress of persecution, there is the arising of false teachers, and because they're under the stress of that persecution, it would be easy to believe some of them. And that's why I see the similarities. I'm sure that someone else sitting there saying, what on earth are you talking about all this politics for? Well, you know, I'm going through the Gospel of John with one of my counselees, and I am amazed at how similar, go ahead and check it out for yourself, how similar the arguments that the Pharisees made resemble the arguments that the left is making in this day and age. I mean, what does the left think about the average citizen of America? We're too stupid. Well, that's exactly what the Pharisees and the religious leaders of Jesus' day said. The people, they don't know. They're stupid. They need us to tell them who the Messiah is, who the prophet is. Because some of them had figured it out a long way. It's kind of like, 
When the prophet comes, is he going to do anything different than this guy has done? The, the Jewish guys, uh, the soldiers, they were sent out by the leadership to arrest Jesus. And when they get there, Jesus is talking and they come back without Jesus and the religious leaders are saying, where's Jesus? They go, no one's ever talked like him before. You guys are a bunch of dummies. That's pretty much what they said. So though I'm talking about the political realm, the same is true. Satan works the same way in the political realm as he does in the spiritual realm. So as we uh, hit the introduction, let's take a look at some of our notes here. The introduction to, of the, uh, to the epistle of 2 Peter. Uh, intro and importance of the epistle. Considering with Jude, or it's considered, 2 Peter and Jude are considered to be the dark corner of the New Testament. Whoa, it sounds like you know one of those uh, lead-ins to a horror movie or something. Um, and the church ignores it at its peril. Look, get on TV, get on the internet, and check out some of the teachers that are out there. And, and because we do everything and it's recorded, you don't got to do it Sunday morning during church, okay? You can do it Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. But you check out some of these people. Now, we've mentioned Joel Olstein here before, uh, but there are plenty of others that the false teaching is out there. I uh, saw an article posted just yesterday that talked about why Christians shouldn't vote at all. Now, I understand where they're coming from, but I look at my citizenship in this country as a stewardship. And if I, don't, if I can't be a part of the influence of as light as it can be, because let's face it, when we get into politics, there's a lot of darkness, right? Very often we have voted considering that we're choosing between two evils. Which one's worse? We don't want to choose that one. I understand. Uh, the reality is, is if you don't do anything, well, then whatever you get, you better live with and we don't want to hear you, okay? Uh, but th their basic idea is, look, we're about the kingdom of God. It doesn't matter who wins, we're going to live as... Uh, Totally agree. It doesn't matter who wins. We're supposed to live as light in the midst of a dark and perverse generation. But if we can have some kind of influence on that, I think we ought to uh, because that's what salt does. It preserves. If you don't want to preserve it, don't vote and live with what you get. So the church ignores Second Peter and Jude uh, at its peril. Number three, when it was penned, uh, knowing that the only sure defense against false teachers and their tactics was found in the truth of God's Word. Uh, I know I've said it several times. Doctrine is important. Pastor, this morning's message, if you want to get technical, look, our mind has to be right. It's got to be set on Christ. Why? Because it doesn't matter if Joe Biden wins. I mean, Kamala Harris. It doesn't matter if you know, it. <laughs> it doesn't matter if Trump wins. Now, if Trump wins, obviously some things might be better for us, but the reality is, is if Kamala wins, we're still going to be Christians and we're still going to shine as lights in the midst of a dark and perverse generation. In fact, it might actually allow us to shine a little bit brighter, which may bring a little bit more persecution, but whole thing is, is if you're going to fight false doctrine, you got to understand good doctrine. Okay, Paul says in Timothy, take heed to yourself and to your doctrine, for by it you shall save many. Now, how many here are able to save somebody else? So the idea obviously is not to save their eternal souls, but it may be the thing that helps them come to a point where they will get saved, or if they're already saved, instead of them just believing anything that comes along, you may be able to help them stay on the right path. So if you're going to fight false teachers you've got to, and their tactics, you, you've got to understand the truth of God's Word. The author. Well, first of all, he identifies himself in verse 1. It says, Simon Peter, a slave and an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who have obtained a faith of equal privilege with ours through the righteousness of our God and Savior, uh, Jesus Christ. So he identifies himself as Peter and, and an apostle. The word Peter there is Petros. It's a piece of rock as a name, 
Petros, uh, an apostle, Peter, a uh, rock. Uh, Peter's name originally was Simeon or Simon. Pastor, they're right there on the back table, uh, or at least hopefully they still are. <laughs> Only made 15, so that might be the last one. Um, he is the son of Jonas. Uh, he is called Simon Barjona. Uh, Jonas is basically the name John, as you see there in John uh, 142. He is part of the family of fishermen. He had a brother named Andrew, and uh, Andrew was the one that brought him to Christ. Now, there is a possibility that Peter, James, and John, and Andrew, uh, Andrew and Peter being brothers, James and John being brothers, there's a possibility that they may have all been cousins too, okay? Um, so uh, he lived in Bethsaida, later in Capernaum, and he had a wife that traveled with him in ministry. If you look at uh, 1 Corinthians 9, 5, uh, also Mark, we see that he has the wife, I believe in Luke, it also explains that he had a mother-in-law, which would indicate that he had a wife, <laughs> okay? Um, he was clearly the leader of the apostles. He is named first in the list of apostles by the gospel writers. And so if Matthew was really all about Matthew, when he listed the uh, disciples, who do you think he would have put first? Himself. But he puts Peter each time. Mark is actually the gospel, if you will, of Peter, but Mark writes it as he's given information. So there you may see it for a wrong reason, but uh, Luke and John also have him uh, listed first. The four gospels have more information about Peter than anyone else except for Jesus Christ. Now, I don't know about you, but that would seem to indicate that there's something important there. Uh, for example, did you know that there's more verses in the Bible about money than about salvation? Now, that doesn't mean that money is more important than salvation. But it does tell you that money is a big deal from God's perspective, and it shows an awful lot about the heart of the person. Okay? Uh, did a little uh, series a while back in our uh, Spirit-Empowered Living in an Ungodly World, and basically showed that uh, from a biblical perspective, Christians are meant to be givers. Now, some people, they, they're gifted in giving. Uh, Rachel, my Rachel, Rachel Montgomery, she loves to get gifts for people. On my birthday a few years ago, she talked to all the brothers and sisters into buying my wife a fantastic vacuum cleaner. I was so blessed. <laughs> She, she loves giving gifts, and uh, not everybody's gifted like that, okay? Uh, there's nothing wrong with that, but are we not all expected by God to be givers? Sure, why? Because he is. For God so loved the world that he charged, no, he gave. He didn't charge, he gave, right? Uh, so uh, Peter is mentioned more times than anybody else other than Jesus Christ in the four Gospels. Uh, he followed Christ. First of all, he was called to follow Christ in Mark chapter 1. He was appointed to be an apostle in Matthew chapter 10 and Mark chapter 3. Now, I don't know if you ever noticed, but Matthew 10 and Mark 3 seems like, wow, those numbers are really out of whack. Got to understand, Matthew is presenting Christ one way. Mark is presenting Christ another way. Matthew deals with a lot of stuff that Mark doesn't deal with. I mean, in Mark chapter 1, Jesus is serving. Why? Because Mark is presenting Jesus as a servant. In Matthew chapter 1, we're getting this genealogy because he's presenting Christ as king, okay? And so there's a lot of things in Matthew, and that's why the difference there in 10 and 3. And then uh, he was given the name Peter or Cephas by Christ in John chapter 1. Uh, as far as his developing leadership, and oh, by the way, leadership is something that is developed. Uh, two weeks from now, on a Sunday night, I'm going to be marrying a young couple, and we're going to pronounce them husband and wife. Now, almost everybody here has been married for several years. Uh, what do they know about being husband and wife? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> zero. <laughs> uh, but we're going to pronounce them that way because that's what they're going to be, and then they're going to learn how to be. Okay, And so the development of leadership, as Pastor has pointed out with BCS and, and so on, is important. Notice he's singled out for special lessons by the Lord, and you can see there's a bunch of them there. 
And, and, and we can sit there and say, well, maybe it's because he's hard-headed. Well, I'm sure that has something to do with it, but it is the development of leadership. Uh, letter B, he was the spokesman for the disciples. Uh, a couple of times, Christ asked the group, you know, and who answers? Peter. Now, sometimes he answered to the detriment of his uh, face, but other times, you know, it's kind of like flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven, that kind of thing. Uh, Letter C, his mistakes and victories are throughout the gospel and the book of Acts. Um, I I don't know about you, but uh, we like to pick on Peter because his mistakes are out there in front of everybody to see. Uh, You know, he sunk in the water. Excuse me, he walked on the water too. <laughs> you know, uh, with, with every uh, failure, there, there was some victory that kind of went with that kind of thing. So um, after the resurrection, Peter led in replacing Judas. In Acts chapter one, uh, he's the one that everybody's there and it's kind of like, hey, you know, there's supposed to be 12 of us. We're gonna rule over the 12 uh, tribes of Israel. So we gotta come up with another guy. And here's what I think we ought to be looking at. He's got to be someone that's been following Christ. He's got to be someone that has seen the resurrected Christ. He he lists a couple of things there. And then they cast the lots. Now, we want to pick on him because he's doing something that's Old Testament. Hey, can I tell you something? For Peter, it was still Old Testament. The Spirit of God hadn't come yet. Now, should he have been picking someone? Well, he used Scripture to make his argument as to someone ought to be, uh, be there to replace him. Maybe if they had waited a little bit longer, they'd have found out that Paul was the guy that God had in mind. But hey, we'll let God worry about that one, right? Uh, So he led in that whole thing. Uh, Letter E, on Pentecost, he was the main preacher. Now, he's the one that the book of Acts lists. Obviously, the other guys were also speaking in the languages of the Jewish people that were there from different uh, areas. Uh, But he becomes the main speaker there. Letter F, he performed notable miracles in Acts chapters 3 through 9. Now, what happened in uh, chapter 9 that all of a sudden the uh, storyline seems to get off of Peter? Nine shine, okay? Paul gets the light and the Lord talks to him and that kind of thing. So, yeah, just trying to remind you of things like that. Uh, And then, of course, notice uh, letter G, he opened the door to the Samaritans and the Gentiles. In Acts chapter 8, Philip is working with the Samaritans, and he's getting people saved like crazy. And uh, so he, you know, sends down to the apostles or calls them up on their cell phone or something like that and uh, lets them know, hey, you guys need to come up and check this out because, you know, I'm just a lowly old deacon. Maybe one of you apostles can, you know, put your finger on this and say, yes, this is real. So Peter goes up there, and some things happened where Peter's recognizing, yeah, these half-breeds, these people that us Jewish people hate, they're saved. And then in Acts chapter 10, he gets that dream, the three times with the sheep being laid, led down, he gets led over to Cornelius' house. He goes over to Cornelius' house, and he starts teaching about Jesus, and bing, bang, bong, they speak in tongues, at which point, you know, he shares a few things with them, and then has to come back and defend himself to the other Jews. It's kind of like, what you doing in a Gentile's house? That's kind of like going to a dog house, you know? So uh, uh, he opens the door to the Samaritans and the Gentiles by seeing what God is doing there and putting his uh, uh, John Hancock on that thing. Letter C, doubts about the authorship. Oh, this is a mar- more sharply disputed than any other book in the New Testament. Now, let's remember something here. Um, the Bible as we have it is not how it was in the New Testament church, okay? That first century, they were sending letters around, and the letters got passed around, okay? And uh, it wasn't until after the persecution ended and uh, Constantine made Christianity legal that the church was actually able to gather the copies of these letters, because it's been a couple hundred years. We're talking 320-ish, 25-ish, and it was one of the councils, and I always confuse them, Council of Trent, Council of Nicaea. It was one of those councils, okay? And they're looking through all these letters and determining 
which one of these belong in the canon? Because at that time, they got the Old Testament and they got all these letters. And so they're looking at it and considering who's the author? Is he an apostle or an associate of an apostle? Um, can, can we verify that this is the guy that wrote it from you know, some of the writers that were around shortly after them? Uh, is it consistent with Scripture? Okay, for an example, there is a gospel of Judas, and there is a gospel, I believe it's of Thomas, and they were all written the end of the first century. If you've ever seen in the back of a magazine, the missing books of the Bible, we found them all, and you can have a copy. Send 99 cents, and we'll throw in a set of Jinzu knives, you know, that kind of a thing. Uh, if you were to uh, follow through and look at some of that stuff, what they're going to send you is a copy of the Apocrypha. Okay, the Apocrypha was not accepted as part of the canon, part of the Bible, by the Catholic Church until the 1500s. And why did they do that? What was going on around the 1500s, 1400s? Reformation. They were losing people left and right, and so they had to do some things to try and draw people back into the Catholic Church. And one of the things they did was to sell indulgences. Another was to... Uh, Bring in the Apocrypha. Look, we, our Bible has more books than theirs. <laughs> that kind of a thing, okay? Um, but the Gospel of Thomas, I'm pretty sure it was the Gospel of Thomas. They think it was written about 93 AD, in other words, even before the book of Revelation, and it was rejected outright. Why? Consistency with what we know. In the Gospel of Thomas, Jesus as a child was making little clay birds and then touching them. They would come to life and fly away. And what does the Gospel of John say? The first sign, the first miracle was when he turned water into wine. As an adult, as one who had been baptized to associate himself with us, had gone off into the wilderness, tempted by the devil, had proven himself worthy. And then, see, as a child, he wouldn't have gone through any of that yet. Wouldn't have been empowered by the Spirit of God to do something that God didn't call him to do. I mean, it's kind of silly to make birds out of clay, touch them, and let them fly off. <laughs> maybe, maybe. Signs don't always bring about belief. But whole point being is Thomas was rejected outright as far as a, a being canonical, canonical, because it was inconsistent with Scripture. So in, in this council, as they're going through the various books, uh, there were a couple that gave him a hard time, Hebrews. Uh, why? Because we're not really sure who wrote Hebrews, okay? Uh, Second Peter, okay, that was another disputed one. And as you see here, it is the most sharply disputed than any other book in the New Testament. Now, when there's a little bit of a dispute about whether or not it should be in the Bible, bring it up 1,900 years, 2,000 years, and what does the left do? The, the liberal side of the church. Well, that, that's, I mean, that was the most disputed book. I don't even believe it belongs there. That's what happens, okay? And that's why we have to talk about some of this stuff. Uh, letter I there, uh, well, letter A, the early church was slow to accept Second Peter. That's what they say. The reference to Paul's writings reflects a time when they would have been collected and accepted as Scripture, which again was a couple hundred years later. The false teachers were those of the second century. That's what they say. Uh, 2 Peter 3, 2 to 4, talking about the... Well, let's just turn there for a moment. Uh, 2 Peter 3, 2 to 4. It says, So that you can remember the words previously spoken by the holy prophets and the commands of our Lord and Savior given through the apostles... First, be aware of this. Scoffers will come in the last days to scoff, living according to their own desires, saying, where is the promise of his coming ever since the fathers fell asleep? They associate the apostles and the fathers as the same people. Now, when we get there, we're going to see, no, he's not talking about the apostles when he says the fathers. He's talking about the fathers of the faith, uh, even earlier type thing. 
Uh, so uh, they, they say they're the same people. And then number four, the prediction of Peter's death in 2 Peter 1.14, right here it says, knowing that I will soon lay aside my tent as our Lord Jesus Christ has also shown me. Uh, that was, uh, it comes from John 21, 18, written after Peter's lifetime. The Gospel of John probably written after Peter had already been uh, martyred. And so someone that came along later could have read John and thrown that in there for good measure to make it sound like it was Peter. So therefore, it wasn't really Peter that wrote it. They also complained that Peter's literary style is uh, dependent upon June. Jude. Jude was written later, and therefore if 2 Peter was written after Jude, he, uh, it couldn't have been Peter that wrote it. That's the idea here. And then a lack of doctrinal themes, unlike 1 Peter. In 1 Peter, he, there's some, some teaching that goes on. In 2 Peter, there's more of a watch out for the false teachers, watch out for the false teachers. Well, um, and we'll see how you answer that as we go along here. And then, of course, notice letter C, multitudes of early church documents with the claim of Peter's authorship. Uh, where is that? Uh, I've, I've written it down. Oh, there it is, way down there. I'll, I'll, I'll get to it. <laughs> in other words, there was a lot of things that were supposedly written by Peter uh, that were found in that uh, second century, third century, and therefore this is just another one of those, that kind of thing. So notice number two on the back side of your page, though it's the most disputed, sharply disputed uh, book as far as whether or not it belonged in the church, it also had more testimony to its validity than any book excluded from the canon. So all the, the Gospel of Thomas, for example, uh, that one's a pretty easy one why it was left out, okay? Obviously, Thomas didn't write it uh, because he would have known uh, what was wrong there. But uh, so notice, arguments and evidence for the acceptance of 2 Peter from the early church. Now, their argument is the early church didn't recognize it. Well, let's look. Origen, he's around 308, a still relatively early church, but we're going to even go earlier than that as we go along. Uh, Origen is the first to recognize uh, this letter as from Peter. Uh, he quoted it as Scripture, implying that 2 Peter was known and accepted. So if he's preaching, all of a sudden he would quote something that we're going to read here in 2 Peter, and everyone would have known, yeah, yeah, that's in 2 Peter. But uh, that would indicate that it, uh, it was understood to be Scripture. His teacher, the guy that discipled him, Clement of Alexandria, wrote a commentary on 2 Peter indicating his belief in its canonicity. So that's earlier than 300, okay? And then we have Justin Martyr. He lived from uh, 100 to 165. So shortly after John's death to about 60 years later, 65 years later, basically quoted 2 Peter 2.1 in the writing that he made, Dialogue with Trypho. Now, he didn't quote it word for word, but what he writes there is almost identical. So it's kind of like, well, obviously, he was aware of 2 Peter, and that's in the early 2nd century. And then we have the Apocalypse of Peter in 100 to 150 AD. It shows literary dependence on 2 Peter. Now, understand the Apocalypse of Peter. That's another one of those books written supposedly by Peter, and whoever wrote it obviously was familiar with 2 Peter. That's the idea here. Uh, then we have the Shepherd of Hermas, again, 100 to 150 AD, similarly seems to paraphrase 2 Peter 3.9. So here you got a bunch of people in the early church that are quoting it, or at least giving the same idea in some of their writings. And then we have 1 Clement uh, uses Greek phrases found in the New Testament only in 2 Peter and not in any extra-biblical writings of that time. So whoever Clement was, or first Clement, he's quoted, using a, a, a phrase that only Peter used. And it's not even used in the classical Greek of Peter's time. And it's not used in Clement's time. So he's copying Peter. He's not copying somebody else. That's the idea here. 
And then, of course, notice Paul's writings spoken of in 3.15 and 16 could just be speaking of the writings with which Peter was acquainted. Uh, what, what writings might Peter have been acquainted with? Well, we know that he wrote from Babylon, code for Rome. Might he have been uh, acquainted with the book of Romans? Especially if you turn the page here to uh, 2 Peter 3, 15 and 16, uh, notice what he says. He says, uh, Also regard the patience of our Lord as an opportunity for salvation, just as our dear brother Paul has written to you according to the wisdom given to him. Now, since Peter is writing to people that we believe were in Rome, Paul has written to these same people. Hmm. But listen what else he says. He says, He speaks about these things in all his letters in which there are some matters that are hard to understand. The untaught and unstable twist them to their own destruction as they also do with the rest of Scripture. Now, I don't know about you, but Romans 6, 7, and 8 takes a little bit of time to grasp. I remember I'd gotten into the ministry. Here I am, 30 years old. I've gone through Bible college. I am a professional. <laughs> and I'm not understanding Romans 6, 7, and 8. And I go to my senior pastor who had been in the ministry at that time like about 37 years, longer than I had been alive. And I said, Pastor, you really need to help me understand Romans 6, 7, and 8. And he goes, man, I don't understand Romans 6, 7, and 8. Now, I'm sitting there going, I'm never going to understand it. <laughs> I, it. It wasn't quite that bad. I think I have a pretty good grasp on it now, but I'm not going to make that a, a positive declaration as though, yes, I got it, and everybody should understand me. Uh, not going there, but uh, is that one of those things that's difficult to, to understand? Sure. And here he is writing the same people. So he would have been aware of Romans. He might have been aware of a couple of the other letters, but it doesn't mean that he was aware of everything that Paul wrote, okay? So they wouldn't have had to have been collected and accepted as Scripture before this person, uh, before Peter would have uh, been able to talk about it. And then uh, notice also uh, the upcoming death wouldn't have come from John. Why? When Jesus talked about Peter dying, who was there? Who's the most important person that was there other than Jesus? Peter. He would have heard it for himself, so it wouldn't have been anything for him to make reference to it, knowing that it's coming up, okay? So he wouldn't have had to read John to figure that out. Uh, that's uh, the idea there. Um, then number 10 the false teachers spoken of here were not necessarily second century Gnostics. Now, this is the same argument that some of the liberals use against Colossians and a couple of the other books that Paul wrote. They were talking, he's obviously talking about Gnosticism. Gnosticism really didn't come into existence as a systematized false teaching until the second century. Yeah, but the roots of it were around in Paul and Peter's day. And so he wasn't necessarily talking about Gnostics, even though that doctrine would have ultimately led to Gnosticism. This Gnosticism was the idea that I have knowledge that you don't, so I'm up there and you're not. You know, Anyone who claims to walk in the light, that idea, if they're going to say they know him, there's got to be a lifestyle that goes with it. And... Uh, the Gnostics were about saying, but they didn't have. All right, that brings us back to his literary style. If Jude was written first, it is the earliest document to cite Second Peter. If Second Peter is written by uh, Peter, he's writing, well, we're going to see down here at the uh, letter D, time, somewhere around 67 uh, A.D., okay? Then Jude would have cited him, or, or vice versa, I'm sorry. That means Jude would have had to have been written earlier is basically what it says. Um, 
I, I obviously wrote that wrong. Um, and then, of course, uh, notice the internal evidence says that Second Peter actually was written first. Uh, notice Peter uses future tense speaking about the false teachers in chapter 2, verses 1 through 3, and chapter 3, verse 3, where Jude uses the present tense in speaking of false teachers in verse 4. So internal evidence would seem to indicate that Peter is talking about someone that's yet to come. Jude's talking about people that are already here, okay? Uh, and then number three, the supposed difference in style between First and Second Peter can be explained by, first of all, different themes. We're talking about two different subjects. So literary style, not going to cover a lot of doctrine if we're talking about watch out for uh, false teachers. But over here, remembering who you are in Christ, that Christ has called you to this, so do it right. Obviously, different themes. And then, of course, uh, different writers. Uh-oh, that might shake someone up. Who wrote uh, First Peter? Silas, that's right. <laughs> uh, Silas is the one that actually wrote it down. Peter told him what to write. Okay, so Peter is the author in the sense of the content. Silas is actually one that wrote it. So Silas may be being not as unrefined as Peter, probably corrected some of the grammatical errors and maybe put it in a way that's a little bit nicer. Uh, if, if I'm going to write something, I want someone else to look at it, make sure that it's understandable and that I haven't been too harsh, okay? And, oh, well, I don't worry too much about that, but there is a measure to where it's not bad to be saying things in the right way. When we come to 2 Peter, say, uh, Peter is in prison. Where's Silas? I don't know, but he's not in the jail cell with him. So chances are Peter is actually writing 2 Peter. And so again, uh, would explain the literary style difference between the two books. And that brings us to letter C. The very council that accepted 2 Peter as part of the Bible, canonical, also rejected a variety of other writings that claimed Petrine authorship. In other words, they claimed to be written by Peter, but these same guys that accepted 2 Peter rejected all these other books. Look, we have the Gospel of Peter. That's not the Gospel of Mark. That's the Gospel of Peter. Uh, we have the preaching of Peter, the teaching of Peter, the apocalypse of Peter, the Acts of Peter and the Twelve Apostles, the epistles of Peter to Philip, and the letter of Peter to James. Those are all claiming to have been written by Peter, and they were all rejected as, no, they're not biblical. They're not consistent. They're not inspired by the Spirit of God. They don't belong in the Bible. There may be some good information in them. Uh, for example, within the Apocrypha. Okay, now we don't believe that the Apocrypha is inspired. Uh, the writers were not uh, carried along by the Holy Spirit to write down what God wanted written down for us. Uh, but if you were to read the Apocrypha, you would find within the Maccabees some good information about the 400 silent years. We call it the 400 silent years between the time uh, of Malachi and the time of Matthew uh, being written. Um, was God silent? There was no additional revelation. That doesn't mean that God wasn't actively involved in what was going on. And uh, when you have Antiochus Epiphanes offering a pig on the altar in Jerusalem, uh, and of course that brought about the re re uh, revolution that the Maccabees participated in, you get to see a fulfillment of something that ha was talked about in the book of Daniel. And so... They may mention that kind of thing. doesn't mean it was inspired of the Spirit. It just means that this back here came true. Um, Jude actually quotes, is it Bell and the Dragon Pastor? Another book in the Apocrypha. Uh, Jude actually quotes that about uh, uh, what Enoch said when he preached. We don't have a book of Enoch, okay? But within the Apocrypha, Someone says that this is what Enoch said, and uh, Jude quotes that. Does that mean that's inspired? No. That means Jude was writing to people that knew that book and said, yeah, this is true, that kind of a thing. So uh, 
a lot of Petrine authorship things rejected by the same council that accepted 2 Peter. So there's no reason why we shouldn't understand that 2 Peter is written by, uh, by Peter. Uh, letter D, time and place of writing. Well, first of all, the time. Tradition says that Peter suffered martyrdom near the end of Nero's persecution. And here's what we know. Nero died in 68 AD. AD 68. I, we always learned it 68 AD, and now they've changed it on me. So, uh, so therefore, uh, 2 Peter must have been written shortly before the apostle's death, probably somewhere around 67 AD. AD 67. There I go again. As far as the place uh, where he wrote it from and the recipients to whom he was writing, the epistle does not say, but since he was martyred in Rome, we'll assume that he wrote it from Rome, <laughs> the prison in Rome, okay? And unlike 1 Peter, the recipients are not named. Why? They've been under some major persecution. You name them, what happens to them? They might end up in the cell next to you, so he doesn't name them. But notice... Uh, however, since it was his second letter, he mentions that in chapter 3, verse 1, he is writing likely to the same people or at least to some of the same people. Now, why would it be some of the same people? When you're under persecution, what's, what two things may happen where you may not be there? Number one, you may, you may be killed, <laughs> okay? And number two, well, how about it's time to sell the house and leave? <laughs> Who wants to live in Illinois? I mean, uh, no, no. moving right along. <laughs> uh, that kind of a thing. Okay, and that brings us, of course, to the occasion. Notice the first letter was written to comfort and instruct believers facing persecution. The second letter was written to address the even more deadly threat of false teaching. Imagine that, false teaching being a deadly threat. Uh, how can it be deadly? Okay, Jim Jones, there's a, a real obvious one. Hey, everybody, drink the Kool-Aid. Uh, yeah, ultimately, if you die without Christ, you know, we're going to die with Christ. To be absent from the body, to be present with the Lord. To die without Christ, to be absent from the body... Well, the rich man, if you remember the rich man of Lazarus, the, lift, the rich man lifted up his eyes in torment. He was in Hades, what we would call hell, okay? Um, that's how false teaching can be deadly, all right? Now, notice number three. The heresy that Peter is writing about is not identified, but confronts those that deny, Peter confronts those that denied Christ, chapter two, verse one, that twisted scriptures, including Paul's writings, chapter 3, verses 15 and 16, that uh, believe clever, cleverly devised fables, chapter 1, verse 16, that uh, believe destructive heresies, chapter 2, verse 1. Uh, he deals with the second coming of Christ in chapter 3, verse 4. Uh, coming judgment in chapter 3, verses 5 and 6. Practiced, notice, practiced, this is a way of life, for some of these false teachers, practiced immorality, chapter 2, verse 2, 13 and 14, and 19. The fact that they despised authorities, chapter 2, verse 10. Please understand, when I say something about Governor Pritzker and his desire to have, or Governor Newsom out there in California, we're closing all the churches. It has nothing to do with the man. It has to do with we live under a constitution, and the constitution says he can't do that, okay? But false teachers, you know, um, what, what is one of the things? Uh, the idea of rebuking the devil. Now, I'm not saying that you, you, there's no authority to do that kind of thing, but when everything is caused by a demon and the devil, instead of, you know, some of it's just caused by our good old-fashioned flesh, we don't need to be rebuking the devil if we're the ones that did it. And so uh, that, that kind of uh, thing there. Despised authority, 2.10. They were arrogant and vain in chapter 2, verse 18. They sought material gain in chapter 2, verse 3 and verse 14. And uh, not only speaks to them, uh, number four, it not only speaks to them, but characterized the false teachers of this day also. And once again, Satan does not have to change 
the way he works just because we're working in the spiritual realm or the secular realm. He works the same way. So as we're going through this, I think you're going to be able to see the similarities in the political realm that he's talking about with a spiritual false teachers because he hasn't had to change the, the means to fool people. That's the fact of the matter. Okay? All right, any questions on the introduction? Uh, true. If Satan is the one that is the reason for all of our sin, then we wouldn't need 1 John 1 9. But I sure do like 1 John 1 9. I like 1 7 too. You know, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. Hmm. So even when we're getting it right, we might not be getting it totally right. You know, it's, I like that it's covered. <laughs> okay. Well, next week we will hit. Uh, uh, our greeting uh, right there at the beginning of the book. And then remember, two weeks from now, uh, stay home. Uh, you can watch it online. We'll pre record it, play it at the same time, at the normal time. And uh, Christmas Eve, if you're interested in a Christmas Eve service, let us know. I've got a piece of paper right here. Put your name on it because if we get four people, I may call you and say, visit your family. If we get uh, a, a small handful, then uh, we will probably do something for you on Christmas Eve. Okay? Pastor's going to be on the road, so he'll watch it on his little TV screen on his uh, computer there, on his uh, phone. Uh, phone. Car. Yeah. <laughs> that, that word was in there. <laughs> well, yeah, it, it last, last year at Christmas Eve, we, we did have a good crowd. So let's go ahead and uh, close in prayer, and we will let you go. Pastor, you're speaking on Wednesday night? It's going to be a good one, isn't it? Save your money, buy the CD. <laughs> Let's close in prayer. <laughs> oh, Father, we thank you so much. You are so good to us. Thank you for the warnings, the helping us understand how our enemy works, not only in the spiritual realm, but even in the uh, political realm. We see this kind of thing. And if it's easy to see there, then we can also take that same knowledge and bring it over into the spiritual realm and start recognizing some that might not be right uh, biblically so that we can not only protect ourselves from false teaching, but maybe warn those that are listening to it. Thank you again for your wonderful love and care for the Savior that you've given to us. And we ask, Lord, that you might guide and direct us throughout this week that we would honor you in the way we think, act, and speak. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Have a good God-honoring week. We'll see you later.